Good. All right. Okay, Thank let's you, go. I'm Joanna Fiore. I'm a trustee at the Saraland Conservancy, and I'm so delighted to introduce Jim Amon, who's our hero, actually, because he's a steward for a number of the um, preserved pieces of the Saraland, but he's also created these wonderful exquisite writings and beautiful photographs. And how many do we have now, Jim? I don't know, 60, 70. And they're compiled in this book, which most of you must own. But if you don't, you can go to our website because we feature it there. And we are gonna do a few housekeeping things. We're gonna keep questions until the end. And you can ask them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask them and Jim will be glad to answer them. We also um, are recording this. And so we will have it on our website at some point. Um, I think that's a good start. Laurie Cleveland is here. She's our executive director and I'm sure she'll say a word or two or ask a question later. Jim? Thank you very much, Joanna. I'm really happy to be here. I uh, didn't see the names of who joined, but I just can't help but think that anybody who joined this meeting is a friend of mine. And so I'm glad to be amongst so many friends. And I wanted to just start the show with a picture that to me epitomizes the Sourlands. Um, it has um, it has a forest in a forest, in fact, with an understory, which is really a special part of the forest. Um, very often the understory is eaten by the deer and you get this park-like um, forest of, of just canopy trees. Um, but there's also um, a branch of the Stony Brook and the Stony Brook has many branches through the Sourlands. And there's uh, some uh, basalt rocks. Uh, there are two kinds of rocks in the Sourlands, basalt and diabase, and they're basically the same uh, they're both volcanic rocks, but the basalt rocks were cooled uh, or reached the surface and were cooled at the surface. Um, so they cooled much faster and, and the, um, the diabase was underground, at least at the time um, uh, that it came out of the volcano and cooled much more slowly and um, is much uh, finer um, grain than the basalt. Um, seeing this picture reminds me to just tell everybody who's watching that you've got to get out right away. The, the Sourland Forest right now is just exquisitely beautiful. And I think, uh, I think you will really be so glad you did if you do go out. Um, the uh, Sourlands is almost a uh, remnant from another century. I mean, look at this unpaved road with a rock that's narrowing the road. Um, who would allow that to happen today? Well, the, uh, <laughs> the West Amwell Township maintenance crew would, that's who. <laughs> and there aren't very many uh, unpaved roads in the Sourlands anymore, but um, there are still some. Um, and if, if it weren't for the utility poles and wires, I think uh, this is a picture that could come straight out of the uh, 19th century. Uh, one of the first things that I uh, always like to make clear is that uh, plants don't just appear on the land. They, uh, they live in communities and uh, they live in predictable communities. Um, if you take a look closely at this picture, uh, in, in the very center here, we can see some skunk cabbage. And we, we can predict that skunk cabbage would be growing there because you can sort of see anyhow that there's a bit of a depression so that that's a little bit wetter there than it is over here, say. Um, so skunk cabbage, Christmas fern. Christmas fern uh, really likes to grow in a, in a place that's well-drained but has uh, access to water. So you see it growing along the banks and streams all the time. 
uh, May apples. Uh, May apples are good buddies with skunk cabbage and Christmas fern. Over here, there's some um, spice bush, and um, and back here, there's a red uh, red maple. So it's it's a it's a community uh, all formed around this uh, wonderful boulder and around alongside one of the uh, tributaries to the Stony Brook. Um, so that it, it's, it, if you see one of these plants, you should look around to see if the others aren't there as well. And um, uh, I, this is a close up of uh, some skunk cabbage. Um, obviously after a, a, either a very wet morning or a rainy day, I don't remember exactly when I took this picture now, but um, uh, skunk cabbage is uh, one of those plants that seems almost like an anomaly in the Sauerlands. Uh, it has these great big leaves. And uh, for the most part, the plants in the Sauerlands are pretty modest. Uh, this looks much more like a tropical plant to me than like a Sauerlands plant. Um, and it's, it's a plant that nobody eats. It's, it's toxic. And so um, it does not really promote much um, good for the, for the other uh, parts of the ecosystem except to provide shade. And um, that does have its, its charm. Um, um, here we have a, a field of may apples uh, with some uh, uh, maple leaf viburnum over top of it. And the may apples are a very interesting plant. Uh, to begin with, this is actually all, all of these may apples, that's one plant. They're all very interesting about them is that nobody knows how old they are. Um, the, these may apples could be hundreds of years old. Uh, they come up, uh, they're coming out right now. They, they haven't flowered yet, but they're, they're certainly the umbrella leaves are all in place. Um, but um, by midsummer, they're, they're usually pretty much gone, like many of the other uh, woodland plants. Um, another interesting thing, to me interesting anyhow, is that um, it takes two mayapple leaves on the same stalk. To producing a flower takes energy. And so if you've got two leaves producing that energy, you can get a flower, but if you've only got one, that's not enough energy to, um, to do the job. Uh, this is a plant that is in flower right now everywhere. It's, it's a trout lily, um, so named because the leaves uh, look a little bit like um, the sides of, of brook trouts. And um, it's, uh, it's an interesting plant because it always points down. <laughs> Um, I've often wondered um, if that wasn't a disadvantage to it. I read up on it a little bit, found that, um, that it is in fact pollinated by uh, insects, but um, the bees tend to get so much pollen from one May apple flower that instead of going to the next one and spreading it around a little bit, they fly right back to their hive and, and deposit it there. And that may explain uh, a, a kind of a curious thing about um, trout lilies, and that is that you can get 40 or 50 or 60 plants and only have one or two of them in flower. Um, I lived in Hopewell Borough for 30 years. I had trout lily in my yard for at least 25 of those years, and it wasn't until the spring that I moved to Lambertville that one of them flowered. And I wasn't sure whether that was a sort of a thumbing their nose at me or, hey, we'll miss you when you're gone. <laughs> so, but uh, anyhow, the trout lily is worth seeing. And right now you can see them uh, all, over the, all over the woodland. Um, a few years ago, I decided that the spring ephemerals, the uh, wonderful little wood, woodland flowers that come out in the spring, uh, flower and then die off and the whole plant dies. Um, should receive a kind of a formal portraiture. And so I did uh, portraits with uh, a black background. Um, there was a very uh, highly complex technical photographic technique I used. I took a black t-shirt with me and hung it behind the plants. <laughs> and, uh, 
and then used a little a little bit of photoshopping to uh, make sure that the texture of the uh, of the shirt didn't show through. But this anyhow is is cut leaf toothwort, and um, I mean it looks to me sort of like a ballerina dancer. It just looks so so graceful and so so beautiful and. And I think that it, along with this one, which is uh, Dutchman's Bridges, and just today I saw lots of Dutchman's Bridges in flower. So if you're in the right place, you'll get to see this plant today. Um, there, the, the Dutchman's Bridges I gather is so-called because this looks like the pantaloons on a Dutchman. I'm not really very sure what a Dutchman's pantaloons look like, but. Uh, Anyhow, that's my assumption. Uh, and this is um, my favorite, I suppose. It's, it's bloodroot. It's the first one to, to come out in the spring, uh, even before the spring beauties, which, um, which are, are pretty much everywhere. And you, you, you may have noticed that aside from the trout lily, everything is white. And that, again, is a matter of conserving energy. If, if you have a plant with uh, big purple leaf, uh, petals on it with yellow splotches all over it. That takes a lot of energy. That grows in the tropics. That doesn't grow in the sourlands, where very shortly after this plant has come up, the canopy closes and it doesn't get the sunlight anymore. Um, I think it's important to realize that you, when you're looking at uh, spring flowers, you need to look at the trees as well as the, as, as the ground. Uh, this is a black oak tree, and um, all of these catkins hanging down are the flowers that will produce acorns. Um, the black oak, is, all of the oaks are really important parts of the forest because more species of Lepidoptera, Lepidoptera are the moths and butterflies, uh, more species of Lepidoptera uh, put their eggs on oaks than on any other tree in the Sauerland forest. Uh, I can't remember the number exactly, but it's like 320 different species use oaks. And um, that means, of course, that as soon as the spring migration starts, the oak trees host all of the, uh, all of the uh, migratory warblers and other songbirds. Um, so if you're out in the woods looking for warblers, look for an oak in flower, and that's where you're very likely to see um, some warblers. Um, this is, of course, a tulip tree, and um, the tulip trees are so tall and so straight that you seldom get to see the flower like this. This was a flower on a branch. The tree was growing in an open field with sunlight coming in from all sides, and so the, the lower branches were able to, um, to produce these, these wonderful flowers as well as the upper branches. But it's, it's interesting that such an exotic looking plant or flower uh, should um, be so seldom seen, even though tulips are one of the most common trees in the Sauerland forest. Years ago, when I was just starting to learn about the natural world, I took Saturday morning classes at Bowman's Hill Wildflower Center. And I've always remembered the Saturday morning that the topic was ferns, the teacher walked into the room and said, you know, just about the most beautiful thing you'll ever see in the forest is a maidenhair fern. Exhibit in point to, uh, to prove what she said. <laughs> uh, this is a close up of a red cedar and uh, red cedars are, uh, are very common, uh, they are, common in fields rather than in forests. Uh, they're, very, they're, they're most often the first woody plant to appear in a field after the field has been abandoned. And so it's, it's a, a, a lesson in plant succession. When a field is abandoned, there is a very predictable sequence of plants that will come in. Um, first, it's a lot of weedy uh, forbs that will come in and then slowly uh, red cedars will come. And the red cedars come because uh, birds will have been eating the fruit and don't digest the seed. And so they, they drop the seed. Um, and um, following the red cedars come the uh, 
the deciduous hardwoods, usually red maples are first in our area, uh, and then tulip trees, and then gradually plants that can tolerate shade like the oaks and hickories will come. So that a, a predictable sequence of, of plants will, will dominate a, a property after it has been abandoned as a farm field. And um, this, uh, the red cedar is one that uh, by the time the deciduous trees arrive, they grow taller than the red cedars and shade it out. And the cedars sort of die from the bottom up. I mean, gradually the lower branches die off. And then finally, there's just a little tuft of, of um, cedar uh, leaves at the top. And finally that goes. And then the cedar will probably stand there for another 20 years or so before it falls to the ground. Uh, dogwood trees. I mean, this is maybe a week ahead of where the dogwoods are right now. This picture it was from a couple of years ago. But uh, what a reward. What a reward to walk into a forest and find a dogwood tree. Isn't that just, just stunning? And it, it's a little bit... Um, difficult for me to say that uh, the dogwood tree is more beautiful than this. This is a sassafras in flower. And it, I, I, what I really like about this picture more than anything else, I think, is that everything about it looks like it's a baby. It looks, the leaves are little babies just emerging. I mean, some of them haven't even developed the chlorophyll to be green yet. You see, they're, they're, they're sort of purplish. Um, others do have chlorophyll in there and in part, but not altogether. And, um, and, and the flowers droop down below these leaves, this cup of seeds that, that is above it. Um, this again is kind of a hard plant to uh, see in flower uh, because it occurs uh, in the canopy. But another thing to know about sassafras trees is that uh, they have a wonderful aroma. It is said, and I'm not sure whether it's true or not, but it's said that when Christopher Columbus was coming to the Americas, long before he saw land, he smelled the American forest and what he was smelling were sassafras trees. Um, I've, I've always wanted to um, praise understory trees. I mean, the sassafras and the dogwood are understories, but this one is too. This is a, a musclewood tree. And um, muscle, uh, the, the whole understory uh, uh, group of plants are critically important, uh, particularly as places for birds to make their nests. Uh, birds really like to nest in understory trees or in some of the taller shrubs. Uh, because it gives them access to both the canopy and to the forest floor. And one of the things about musclewood is that it, uh, it, it strikes me as being just a perfect example of being opportunistic. I mean, you, you look at this picture and you wonder, what's the history? Why are these branches going in all these different directions? And the answer has to be that, well, one started out and then it died and another one took off from somewhere along that. And it just, just sort of branches out in this uh, really magical kind of, uh, of pattern. Um, the musclewood is called musclewood because the branches, uh, as you can see, look sort of like a, the, the forearm of a very muscular person. Um, it's also, incidentally, another name for it is ironwood. Um, I don't particularly like that name for it because there is another plant whose common name is ironwood. It's also called American hornbeam. And there is, of course, a hop hornbeam. And so if you call it a hornbeam, you're not being very clear. It is sometimes called a blue beech, which is really a name that's sort of off the wall because it's not a member of the beech family. It's a birch family tree. Uh, but like beech, it doesn't have um, a, a, a wrinkled bark. Uh, but on the other hand, if you know that this is Carpinus caroliniana, there's no question about it. You can go anywhere and say Car Carpinus caroliniana, and you're giving the information that somebody will need. Uh, one of the interesting things to me about um, the uh, deciduous trees is that the leaves on them uh, don't just turn color and fall off. 
the leaves are actually expelled by the trees. Um, what happens is that when the, when the um, daylight period begins to shrink enough, it gives the tree the signal to, uh, to create a blockage between the limb and the stem of the leaf. Um, what happens then is that the leaf is no longer getting any of the nutrients that are coming up from the roots. And so it consumes all of the chlorophyll that has made it green. When the chlorophyll is all consumed, the leaf reveals either a yellow or an orange or, or a red color. Um, and then it finally dry, drops off, which is just what the tree had in mind. And it has that in mind for it. This is awfully anthropomorphizing trees, I realize. But the idea is you got to get rid of your leaves before the snow falls, because the snow can use each leaf as a platform to build up on. And it will break limbs and bring down whole trees. Um, a few years ago, we had a terrific snowstorm on August, October 30th. And all of the tree, all of, a lot of trees all over the Sourlands were still in, in leaf, especially the oaks. And many, many of them died. I've never seen a, a, anything more tragic than the Sourlands on the, the morning after that, when there were especially red oaks just everywhere you looked lying on the ground. Um, championing the un, under recognized and the underappreciated. Um, Sedges. This is a sedge called Squarosa sedge. It doesn't have another name. It doesn't, you know, it isn't prickly burr sedge or anything like that that would make it easier to remember. In fact, I have to look it up every now and then to remind myself what the name of it is. Um, the, the botanical name for it is uh, Carex squarosa. And the, the common name is Squarosa sedge. So it's, <laughs> it's, it doesn't help any to, uh, to, to, to remember it because it's a, not a name that, that we're very familiar with. But I mean, who plants this, this kind of a plant in their garden? And yet, isn't this as pretty as a daffodil? I think so. Uh, dogbane. Dogbane is a relative of the um, of milkweed. And uh, I'm not sure why it's called dogbane. It ought to be called bane to all because the whole plant is, is toxic. Um, so that any critter that comes along and tries to eat it will, um, will get very sick or die. Um, dogbane, as you can see, attaches a parachute to each of its seeds just as milkweed does. And there are a lot of different techniques for um, propagation. Uh, some plants sort of spit their seeds out. Uh, the wild geranium, for instance, um, when, when the seed pod is ripe, it opens and the, it sort of springs the seeds um, so that they, they go, oh, 18 inches maybe away from the plant. Um, acorns rely on um, critters, mostly uh, squirrels, of course, to um, bury their, their, or oak trees rely on <laughs> On squirrels to bury the oak, the acorns and to forget them. And squirrels do forget about 20, 25 to 35 percent of the caches that they make in the fall. Um, the idea, I mean, some plants also have little stickers attached to their seeds so that when an animal walks by, the, the sticker attaches to the animal's hide and uh, travels to wherever the animal decides to. Um, to scratch it off. Another favorite technique is to put a delicious fruit around your seed. Uh, crab apples, for instance, or black haw viburnums have um, these delicious fruits that uh, birds can't resist and, and can't digest the seed. But um, I think the uh, dogbane has come up with an effective and quite strikingly attractive way of dispersing its seeds. Uh, fungus. Um, I don't know what fungus this is. I don't know much about identifying funguses. And I showed this to two fungus experts, and neither of them could tell me what it is either. But um, boy, what a prize, you know, to walk into the woods and find this. 
uh, wow, <laughs> I was just bowled over by it. Now, in all of these folds are, is a spore. And so the, the purpose of the mushroom, and this is the mushroom on the fungi, um, is, to, uh, is to propagate. Uh, one of the little facts about fungi that I've always cherished is that the largest living organism in the world is a fungus in Oregon that uh, covers um, about two square miles of land. Um, so it's, it's really um, quite an astonishing plant. There's a wonderful book uh, by a man with a fabulous name of Merlin Sheldrake about fungi. And um, if you have even a mild interest, I, I highly recommend uh, that you take a look at this book. Uh, this is a plant that we don't find very often. It's, it's Indian type. And it's not a fungus, it's a parasite. And it's a plant that obviously, since it's all white, there's no green, it doesn't rely on chlorophyll to, to grow. It produces each one of these that flowers produces about six seeds that um, that drop to the ground, um, and maybe that's why you don't see it too often. It's because it doesn't have um, the propagation techniques of uh, some of the more common plants. It's actually a member of the blueberry family, and um, what I say in the essay that's in the Seeing with Sauron's book is that I guess every family has a black sheep. Um, because this, is, this has got to be the black sheep of the blueberry family. Uh, praying mantises are fascinating animals. Um, they have this fabulous camouflage, and yet um, it's, it's really quite clear that um, they, they think that they're not being seen when they are. Um, they have two large uh, compound eyes. This is one of them here. And then they have three other small eyes in, in between their compound eyes. And um, praying man this praying mantis in particular, when it realized that I was sticking my camera though 18 inches away from it, it moved around a little bit, but it didn't, didn't seem to care that much. It seemed to be very confident that it would be um, unseen, even though I was right there next to it. Um, you can see how clever it is about holding on. I mean, here is one of its back legs holding on to this, and here and here are, are other legs. It's, um, uh, this, this leg is holding on to a branch that's not in the picture. Um, and it, it has this very, very firm grip and moves really quite slowly. It mainly what it likes to do is to just sit still. And when a butterfly comes along, it moves very, very fast and grabs it. And you can see the, um, the of uh, things that will hold the butterfly there and, and down here as well. I mean, this is a guy, once he gets a butterfly in his grip, um, that butterfly is not going to get away. And what it does is just, he just eats it alive. He just, I, I, I watched one one time. Unfortunately, I didn't have my camera with me, but I watched it um, just bite the head off the butterfly and then proceed to eat the rest of it. Uh, it's it's uh, an animal that you, you have to look hard in a, in a field to find. You won't find it in the woods, you'll find it in the field. And you have to really look hard because it's, it's so well camouflaged and it doesn't, um, doesn't up and fly away right away. Um, this is uh, actually, believe it or not, it's a, a moth. This is a hummingbird moth. Um, and you can see it's, uh, it's sucking nectar from this thistle with this long tube which when it's flying about from one flower to the other, it coils into a, like you coil up a hose uh, and tucks it under his chin. Um, the one way that you can tell that it's a moth is by these antennae that do not have little bulbs at the end. Um, 
when I first, the first time I saw this guy, I thought it was some kind of really nasty bee. <laughs> and um, it was interesting to me that um, all of the uh, things that I found in the, on the internet about the hummingbird moth referred to it as looking like a hummingbird. Well, it, it can hover the way a hummingbird hovers, but it doesn't really look to me anything like a hummingbird. I, I can't imagine confusing this with a hummingbird. Um, while we're here though, I'd like to say a word in favor of thistles. Um, there are uh, hundreds of different kinds of thistles worldwide. Uh, and some of them are invasive in this country. There are two particular thistles that are native to the Sauerlands region. They grow in fields. They, they need to have full sun around them all the time. Um, but they, um, the, the, the two that are here are field thistle and tall thistle. Now, field thistle is about six feet tall. And so it's lucky that tall thistle is maybe 10 feet tall. So, so it's, it, you can tell them apart by their height. Um, they're, they're, you can also tell them apart a bit by, by the structure of their leaves. But thistles are critically important um, sources of food for much wildlife. Um, butterflies, if, if you're ever around a thistle in late July or August, I, I dare you to look at it and not see a butterfly there too, because butterflies love to, to, to get nectar from a thistle. In fact, every single one of these things that look like hairs is in fact, a separate flower with a separate little tube that has uh, nectar in it. So this butterfly moth could uh, could get an awful lot of nectar out of this plant and there'd be plenty more for the next um, critter that comes along. Um, many people think that all thistles are bad. They certainly are um, unpleasant to get too close to. But um, I think that we need to change our attitude about tall and field thistles and recognize them as important contributors to the, um, to the ecology of our region. Um, the, of course, when they, when they go to seed um, in the fall, that's when you'll, you'll find um, uh, uh, golden goldfinches um, eating those seeds and many other birds to, um, to really do like them. Um, a couple of years ago, I decided that I would photograph butterflies. And um, I found it was a, a tricky sort of proposition. I'd read that the best time to photograph butterflies is around nine o'clock in the morning because they are cold blooded. And by, at nine o'clock, they haven't quite warmed up enough to be fast flyers. Uh, this is, of course, is a tiger swallowtail uh, butterfly. The swallowtail is, is this and this is hanging out. Um, it's a, um, it, it was also interesting me to find out which butterflies I could get close enough to to get a picture like this. Um, I found that it varied a great deal from one species to another. And that it varied within the species from individual to individual. But in general, I found that the tiger swallowtails were the ones that allowed me to get closest to them, um, especially if they were on a good source of nectar. Well, I grew up in Ohio, and so I have to include a picture of a common buckeye. Uh, butterfly for you. <laughs> this common buckeye is, is uh, nectaring on uh, milkweed. And um, it is said that the, um, the eye spots, you know, this and, and this are a way of uh, deterring predators. And um, that, you know, a predator will fly over and see those eye spots and say, oh, that guy's looking right at me. I better keep going. I don't know how that could be. I mean, you look at this critter and you see these bright orange stripes up at the forewing and you see the, the orange stripe at the bottom and all the other colors and 
all the patterns that are going on, you'd have to be a pretty dumb predator not to know that those that, that this is a this is a, a good lunch rather than uh, something that you shouldn't get near. Uh, this is a wood nymph butterfly, and um, they're they're a really quite common uh, and quite beautiful, I think. Uh, especially the underwing part of them, I find especially uh, attractive. Um, while I was photographing butterflies, I decided to also photograph dragonflies and uh, did a little research on them. And the first thing I learned, which I hadn't known, I'd always thought that there were, or I knew there were dragonflies and damselflies. And I just figured that the damselflies were the females and the dragonflies were the males. Uh, no, they're a different species. <laughs> the dragonfly is one species and the damselfly is another. They're very much alike. But in general, the damselfly will have a much uh, thinner body than this. And they also um, will hold their wings up in the air when they're at, at rest like that. Um, this particular dragonfly is called a Halloween pennant dragonfly. And um, I, I, I guess it's because it's orange and black is uh, the, the reason for it. But it's, um, it's a fairly common uh, dragonfly uh, along streams in where there's plenty of sunshine. Um, dragonflies have uh, remarkably quick re reactions. They can um, be in front of you one moment and the next moment they're just gone. Uh, this is a, a really nasty looking spider. It's a couple of inches long. Uh, it forms an orb nest and sits in the middle of it. This is the female of the yellow and black garden spider. Um, it turns out, though, that if by any chance, you know, you allow it to bite you, it, the bite is sort of like a mosquito bite. It's not any worse than, than it might be. Um, so spiders in general form two different kinds of nests. They form an orb nest, which is, you know, that wonderful pattern that you see stretching between two um, parts of, uh, two stems of a, of a plant or tree. And the other is a kind of a cluster nest that is formed in the ground um, or on the ground. And um, the, um, the orb nest sometimes will stretch across a path, especially in the fall um, when spiders are, um, are laying their eggs and preparing to die. They seem to go on a, a, a nest or a, a web building frenzy and it's very hard to walk on a path in the fall without getting a spider web in your face, unless you happen to be walking behind a taller person. So that's the trick is to uh, always go with somebody who's taller than you and say, oh, I'd like, I'd like you to go first. <laughs> uh, the uh, black and yellow garden spider um, sits in its nest and is alerted to the, um, the nest having caught a, uh, an insect by the, by the jiggle that the nest makes. And so it goes over to it and injects it with a poison that paralyzes it, it wraps it in, in um, this um, uh, web material. And then uh, gradually the, uh, the insect will turn inside, its insides will turn to liquid. And that's when the spider will make it its, its meal because spiders don't have big enough mouths to eat an insect at whole. They have to liquefy it first. Oh, I, I forgot, I was going to mention about how spiders get their webs to cross a path. I mean, you can very often see a, a web reaching six or eight feet. And the answer is that they rely on wind. The wind will, they're, they're very light and the wind will just blow them from one place to another and they're spinning out this, this uh, silken web as they go. Um, there are reports that uh, pilots of light airplanes have found spiders on their windshields at two or three thousand feet in the air 
because the spider miscalculated what the wind was going to do to it. <laughs> Uh, one of my favorite insects, a water strider. <laughs> the um, water strider has, um, actually, it doesn't have star-like uh, legs. Uh, this and this and this and this are the reflection of the, of the real legs. The, spy, this, the water strider has six legs. And the question that everybody wants to know about a water strider is how come it doesn't get wet? <laughs> and, I mean, it always stays on the surface of the water. And the answer to that is, first of all, it's, it's very light. This is, this is an enlargement. No water strider has ever been this large. Um, and the, but in addition to that, it, it does have six legs like all insects, and it has these long feet and covering all, every part of those feet is just, they're just chock-a-block full of little tiny hairs and the little hairs trap air. And so it's kind of buoyant in that sense from the air that, it, that its uh, legs are providing. Um, the next question that I always had about water striders is that they seem to be sort of propelled by magic. Um, you know, you're standing next to a stream and you're looking down at a water strider and boom, it's moved six feet. And how does it do it? Well, it does it. You can see that its, its legs are producing these little dimples in the water surface. And actually it's the, the middle legs that it uses, it pushes against the backside of that dimple and that's what causes it to, to move. Um, it's really uh, remarkable that they could get such propulsion out of such a little tiny dimple in the water. Um, water striders are, are curious animals because um, some of them have wings and some don't. And it turns out that the ones that have wings are ones that are living in um, ponds that will dry up. And um, it's not clear exactly how they, when the pond is drying up, how that sends a signal to them to grow wings, but they do. And it's, it, it's, it's interesting, scientists have reported that when they have created a new pond again and again and again, within what seems like minutes, but it's probably just days, water striders appear. And so they have this sense that the air is filled with water striders flying around looking for water to land on. And I've never noticed a water strider in the air, but maybe they're up there. <laughs> they, they are little guys. Um, one of the things that they do, they can jump if they, if they encounter an obstacle in the water, they can jump over it. If they encounter another water strider, they're likely to just eat it, which is a good way of getting things out of your way, I guess. <laughs> uh, I've written an essay about ants that hasn't been published yet, but I realized I didn't have a very good picture to go with it about ants. And so I put a daub of honey on a, on a jar lid and set it on the floor of my patio and sat down next to it with my camera. And before long, boom, here was this lovely ant. <laughs> and um, the, I have another picture with about a zillion ants <laughs> all around this honey. Um, ants are, are really quite remarkable creatures. Um, they, uh, if they could, they would just rule the world and maybe they will someday, who knows. Um, but they have very specialized uh, jobs within, within their nest. Um, the queen doesn't do anything but lay uh, eggs. Um, there is a coterie of males who um, are there to service the queen. Um, there is then this huge uh, group of female workers. Um, the males who aren't, uh, aren't uh, helping the production of eggs 
uh, are either expelled or die off. Um, they don't need men except, except for males, except for reproduction. So it's all females and they are fierce. They, they, they work in, in armies. They, they're willing to give up their life for the good of the, of, of the nest. And, um, and, and there's just, uh, just so much uh, complexity to, um, to their lives. Um, of course, Edmund Wilson is the ant, ant expert. And there is a book that he's written that is um, readable by people like me who are not, uh, not really expert. Um, I always say to myself that I'm not a um, bird photographer because I don't have a, a 600 millimeter lens. Um, but every time I see a bird, I end up taking pictures of it just in hopes that it'll come out all right. <laughs> and um, this one of this great blue heron did come out all right. Um, I, I always, when I see herons, I love them. I can never get enough of seeing herons. But I'm often reminded when my wife and I were teaching her sister how to be a bird watcher, we were watching birds in the forest, uh, you know, flying around in a canopy. And she said, well, I don't like this at all. Uh, they're too far away and they're moving around too much. I like large birds that don't move much. And I mean, who doesn't? <laughs> and that's exactly what a great blue heron will do for you. Uh, this is a charming little song sparrow. Um, one of the, the most common uh, 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 of the sparrows that we have. It lives in, um, in fields or on the edges of, of woods. Um, you can uh, most easily identify it with a, it's this dark patch on its breast. Um, but um, you can also identify it quite easily by its call, which um, birders have, uh, have given, um, have taken bird calls and repeated them in onomatopoeic phrases so that the song, bird, song sparrow is said to be calling, maids, maids, put on your tea kettle, little, 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 little. And so if you hear somebody telling you to put on your tea kettle, little, 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 you've got a song, song sparrow in the area. Uh, this is one of the unusual uh, birds that spends the winter down here, winter and spring. I mean, this is this one is a little light uh, to be still in uh, New Jersey. This is a white-throated sparrow, and they come down from more northern territories and spend the winter here, and then um, just about now they fly back north again to um, to make their nests and to raise their families. Um, the, it, an interesting thing about their, their, their call and the birders uh, onomatopoeic uh, definition of it is that around here, it's usually said that the white-throated sparrow is singing, Sam, Sam, Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. But when you go to Maine, the Mainers say that the white-throated sparrow is singing, oh, Canada, Canada, Canada. So it all depends on where you're from. Ah, Mr. Bluebird's on your shoulder. <laughs> Never on my shoulder, <laughs> how I wish. <laughs> uh, bluebirds are year round residents of our area. Um, they, um, in the winter especially, they travel in little flocks. So if you see one, you very well might see uh, a half a dozen or eight uh, or nine of them together. And, um, uh, they're just uh, such a beautiful bird and so, so such a treat to see. Um, another example of me championing the underappreciated. Uh, I think if this bird, this morning dove were hardly ever seen, seeing one would be one of the most memorable experiences of your, of your day. I mean, what a gorgeous bird this is. I mean, look at these beautiful feet and this lovely art deco kind of uh, matter pattering on, on its wing. Um, and who knew that morning doves have a little blue eye ring. Uh, I was, I photographed Canada geese again and again and again. Of course, they're large birds that don't move very fast. 
And I kept trying to figure out how can I photograph a Canada goose so that it looks a little bit less than a boring old Canada goose. And so I took this picture by, first of all, having the shutter speed, speed very slow, and secondly, moving the camera when I, when I took it. And I think, uh, I think this gives you a sense of this, this wonderful goose uh, swimming in the creek. Uh, the pileated woodpecker is one of the treats that we seldom see. I see them maybe once or twice a year. It's the largest of the woodpeckers that we have in our area. I like to think that it's the woodpecker that was used as a model for Woody the woodpecker. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a big, beautiful bird. And just whenever I do see one, I feel so, so much like I've gotten a treat. Uh, you seldom see uh, great horned owls like this. Great horns, by the way, the horns are these tufts of feathers. Um, great horned owls are right now raising their babies. They, they built their nests in January, laid their eggs in February, and um, the owlets are um, not yet fledged, but they're getting pretty big by now. Um, and um, this is uh, one of the best hunters uh, in the woods. No, no, it, it, owls have the ability of flying almost perfectly silently so they can swoop down and the poor little mice and voles never know they're coming. Um, one of the interesting things about bees is that they store the pollen that they, or the nectar that they're gathering in little sacks attached to their rear legs. Uh, the, the bees that, uh, gather both pollen and nectar, and they take both back to their hives, but they also, of course, spread the pollen uh, in other flowers and, and thereby fertilize them. Uh, but the, the nectar is used uh, principally uh, as, a, as a food for the, for the newest babies. The nectar is uh, what is used to make honey which is also their food. Uh, box turtles are a curious uh, little animal. They, uh, they can live to be 20 years old or so, and they might never leave their home territory of about 100 yards. Um, so if you find one, don't pick it up and take it to another part of the forest, because if you do, it might become so disoriented that it will die. Uh, rabbits are, uh, I think, decreasing in numbers. I haven't seen anything official about that, but I think because we have such an increase in red foxes and coyotes in our area, that the rabbits are, are having a hard time with it. But um, again, what a treat to find one. I, there, there is no animal that ever looked up and saw a human being coming toward it and thought, oh good, there's a person coming. They, none of them. None of them think that. But I nevertheless insist to myself that this frog is smiling at me. I mean, <laughs> it's of course just the shape of his mouth, but it's, that's gotta be a smile. Hi, Jim, how you doing? <laughs> this is a green frog, by the way, uh, one of the common frogs we have in our area. And this is, uh, the, the final picture is an advertisement for, uh, for the book. The uh, the advertisement at the beginning and at the end of the show. Uh, so if uh, any 